We're going to talk about some random stats. And uh, who better to talk random stats with than Jeremy Frank? Jeremy, you're muted. Good to see you, man. Hey, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. Uh, if, for those that, okay, so we know you as MLB Random Stats, but tell, tell everybody about yourself a little bit. Yeah, so um, I go by LB Random Stats, but um, my real name is not LB Random Stats. It's actually what? Jeremy Frank. <laughs> I know, right? People are shocked to learn that a lot. But um, I'm currently at Purdue. I'm a sophomore studying data science. Um, I'm from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Huge baseball fan, big Cubs fan, but it's kind of hard to be a big Cubs fan. The recent offseason, but... Yeah, I'm so okay. sorry. You had your moment, though. We you did. That's all, That's all I asked. That's all I asked for. <laughs> uh, so you've also written some books. I have um, me and my buddy Jim Passan, um, not to be confused with Jeff Passan. Uh, Jim Passan has a very similar account to me on Twitter at Passan Jim. Um, we co-wrote um, Hidden Ball Trick, Volume One, and Volume Two: The Baseball Stats You Never Thought to Look For. Um, the first book goes from 1876 until 1919, going year by year through baseball history, looking at the best stats from every season. And the second book goes from 1920 until 1969 and the third book currently in progress will go from 1970 until um last year i guess but we'll nice. worry about that when we get there so um but yeah if you're interested in looking if you're interested in some baseball stats from the past uh check them out on amazon just hit ball trick look on my name whatever definitely would recommend if you're if you like random baseball stats learn about history or you could, of course, just sign up uh, with the Google form for prizes because at thirty-seven fifty, you will win a copy of both Hidden Ball Trick Volume One signed and Signed by both of the authors too. Signed. Yes. Oh, man, I should have put that in there. Look at that. I oh, know. I awesome. didn't realize. It's tough to get. <laughs> it, they're very rare because me and Jim live. He lives in out in Washington State. I'm at either at college or in Illinois, so it's a lot of work to get both two or right. get a book by both of us. So very rare book. And is your signature like something special or is it just cursive? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. They like barely talk cursive like nowadays. Like when I was in third grade, we could, we had like a little bit of cursive, but that was it. Like I, my signature <laughs> is so inconsistent that like each one is its own thing now. Like I'm sure if you look at like three books, I'd sign all the signatures are totally different. Yeah. I had a moment where I uh, decided to like make a signature, like an interesting one, and it's terrible. But it's, it's not like a, it. it's a stick thing. with what you're comfortable with. Oh, God, I hate it so much. And yeah. anyway, uh, we have someone else here. We have Mike Petriello, of course. Mike, welcome. Hello, friends. Thanks for having me. Oh, my God. Look at that guitar. That's not uh, bad, I, I'm right? like, so what? How have I never known about this until now? It's actually like a real Les Paul. Like if someone better than me could play it, it would sound really good. And uh, <gasps> it's, it's it's like a great guitar, but it just looks nice on Zoom backgrounds. Too. Oh my God, it's amazing. Okay, like a, like a Gibson or an Epiphone? It's a, it's a Les Paul, yeah. Oh man, oh my God. All right, well, that's that's incredible. Uh, Mike, uh, introduce yourself to everybody. Of course they already know you, but still, uh, tell us all about yourself. I'm Mike Petriello. I write for MLB.com, um, mostly focusing on StatCast and stats. And every once in a while, ESPN lets me go on TV and nerdcast it up. And now I'm here talking to you guys. Yeah, uh, those those StatCast uh, broadcasts are amazing. Uh, I, one day, I hope it's just that broadcast. Because instead of like, hey, go to the yeah. other one. Uh, you day. guys absolutely deserve it. Also, the it sounds like a lot of work. Room. <laughs> yeah. well i mean every single week i mean i think you talked about this before uh we're creating those it's not like something you can do every single day because you have a lot of prep work to do for each one yeah i think every one of those i mean it's a special event you know so you're really trying to blow it out we only do like three or four a year um i just today got like a preliminary list of ones we might do this year which is pretty cool but yeah nice. every time it's like you know a 15 to 20 page google doc just full of stuff and i like pound the producers emails with like here's all the stuff i want to build can you build all of it for me <laughs> oh, that sounds great and of course we had jason benetti for the last pitch con so that means next year we're going to have eduardo perez of course so we just got to complete the whole stack has broadcast here at PitchCon. um but yeah i mean we're going to talk about random stats and cool stats and i figured you know you two are the best people to talk about that with uh so i kind of wanted to start off just by talking about your histories with it and you know your uh, your experience in the field uh yeah mike we'll stay with you at first when did you really understand like oh hey numbers in baseball this is really really cool well my earliest memory with this and maybe this shows how old i am is being like seven years old and sitting on my fireplace reading one of those bill james annuals like the old mm. phone book sized yellow pages ones he would yep. put out and this is like the 1988 version <laughs> so <laughs> 
<laughs> when I was born. Yep, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so there's that. I mean, you know, that didn't like start me on a baseball career at eight years old or anything. But I think that was like the first time I was like, oh, there's maybe more to life than just like RBIs and pitcher wins and so on. Um, you know, and I was always a baseball fan and I went to school for history as one does when they want to get into talking about baseball statistics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after that, you know, I've, I'm a Dodger fan from the East Coast and for years and years, I never got to listen to Vince Scully or watch Vince Scully. Uh, and then that changed in 2005 when like that was the first time we got the extra innings package. And that team was awful, like just mm-hmm. god awful. But they were great because it was the first time I watched Vince Scully. And I realized, um, you know, I was living in Boston at the time and I didn't know any Dodger fans and I needed to find some community to talk about the game with. And I, I came across, you know, like John Wiseman's Dodger thoughts was a big deal uh, and this message board. And I got just like super into communicating with these people. And I was like, this is, these are fun posts to do. Maybe I'll throw them up on a blog. And um, at the time, you know, like BP was going and Fangraphs is going to going and like Rob Nyer was a big deal. And, you know, all those influences on, you know, there's a, there's a different way to think about things than just like the TV graphics. And at the time, this isn't true anymore. If you were just like writing vaguely interesting things about a team from a mildly advanced stats perspective, that was like a big deal, you know? Cause like right now all the beat writers do it. Cause all the beat writers are great. That wasn't true in 2006. <laughs> you know, So yeah. it was like, you could really, there's a little bit of a, of a cold war going on, I guess. But um, I did that. And people liked it for some reason. And that, you know, took me to Fangraphs and ESPN and MLB. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that that Cold War. Uh, I, what is it? Like the last like four years, we finally have seen OPS on the TV graphic, like constantly. <laughs> right. I mean, I remember being so excited for that when the first time I saw it. I was like, oh my God, they're actually embracing this. And it's not just their average RBI and like runs and that's it. Uh, that was definitely a huge moment. Um, and Jeremy, I mean, yeah, how do you get to be in a place where you write these books and become a huge uh, uh, Twitter uh, baseball nerd? It's great. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I think if I grew up when Mike grew up, I don't think I'd have the opportunities available to me with like social media and stuff. Um, it, it obviously came about. Um, I, I was lucky that I was kind of I, ha- I had that when I was a teenager, but uh, grew up huge baseball fan. Mom is a big Cubs fan. Dad's a big Sox fan, White Sox fan. I know when I say the Sox, a lot of people think Red Sox, but um, dad's a big White Sox fan from Chicago. Um, grew up collecting baseball cards, reading all the numbers in the back, like Mike one does. Um, saw the movie Moneyball. It came out probably when I was like 10 years old. That really opened my eyes, I think, uh, as to how not only um, like with baseball cards, that there, there are just numbers in baseball, but also that teams are going to use numbers to help their team win. I'm like, oh, like I want to do that. Like That looks really cool. And then um, probably five years later, discover the uh, baseball reference play index, which is the coolest thing of all time, probably. Um, kind of just look up whatever you want, baseball stat wise. Anything happens, you can find the last person to do it. And so I really liked doing that. I, I grew up really good at math. Numbers in baseball was just, it was like a dream for me. So I, I made my Twitter account um, to post these random MLB stats that I came across, called it MLB random stats. I was a freshman in high school at the time. and. Yeah, there I, there was a much bigger baseball stats community than I realized at the time when I made the account. I'm like, oh, there'll be like a couple hundred people interested in this kind of thing. But turns out it was a lot more than that. So I've been able to, like, I don't really have any credibility in the baseball industry besides the fact that a lot of people like the fact that I'm good at using the baseball reference play index. I don't have a job in baseball or anything like that. It's just I'm very quick with the play index, which which gave me credibility, I guess, which allowed me to have a platform to write these books with my buddy that I met online, which is such a crazy story. But yeah, that's really how I got here. Um, I'm studying data science, hoping to work in baseball one day, because a lot of teams are hiring nerds like me do to help their teams win baseball games, which is so different than it was a couple of decades ago. So it's really crazy that social media has been able to help me get to where I am. But that's really it. That's really all it is. I mean, credibility, schmettability, honestly, like <laughs> what you do is great and it comes from a good place and you know what you're doing. And, you know, when given opportunities, it's about, are you going to actually do a good thing or not? And you are, you know, you wrote this fantastic book and you know what you're talking about and you present it in the right way. And that's all that really matters in the end. I think at this point, 
Uh, obviously, a lot different back in the day where you had to, you know, we've, we've talked to a lot of writers where they had to work at their local papers and then, you know, take the steps up. And it's a completely different environment now. I mean, I just showed up here like seven years ago and I don't know how, you know, we're doing the things that we're doing now. It's just like this is how the Internet works now. And I mean, even looking back, you know, Mike, you uh, you talked about going on forums and discussion forums, right? Before like what, 2009 or so, or 2010, I mean, there was no true outlet. It was just through the comment section of a site or these discussion forums. And it's really interesting to hear all of these communities kind of sprout from them. Um, what were the ones that you really focused on and then you saw like these innate communities build? Yeah, at first, like I said, it was uh, John Wiseman's Dodger Thoughts. And I just read there and John's a good mm -hmm. friend of mine now, but I didn't really comment. There was this site and I think there's still a version of it out there somewhere. It was called the Big Blue Wrecking Crew, which I thought was a, a fun name. It was Dodgers focused, right? Um, so, you know, after a while, I realized that you're writing like 400 words in a comment. And I'm like, hey, maybe I should just like put that somewhere. I should right. put that somewhere. And, you know, Facebook was out, but it was not as toxic as it is now, I guess. And Twitter wasn't really a thing yet. Like, there are still comments sections, but it's definitely not in the same way that it once was. You know, now it's like, throw something up on a site and then pump it out through social and try to get someone to look at it and, and retweet it. And, you know, as, as Jeremy indicated, that's a pretty good way to get visibility quick. If you've got something worth sharing, if you've got a unique angle or, or a particular skill or something, it, it can be done a lot quicker. Now. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, let's kind of talk about, you know, the transition, right? So back then, I, I remember very much so, I, I mean, when I started doing this whole thing about the different emphasis that I would put on certain players, we were like, okay, Babbitt was a major thing in home run fly ball rate and ground ball rates, which are still obviously important, but then we have this whole bevy of extra data now and different different access to things that we didn't have. Uh, so what kind of transitions have you seen, Mike, from like back in the day with the discussion forums to now that you start, you know, what was your journey of where you were looking and focusing on? Well, I recently looked back at one of the very first things I ever wrote, which was like 2007. And it was like an argument over Wilson Bedemy to play third base over Nomar Garcia Para. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I used fielding percentage uh, in that post. You know, it's like 14 years ago at, at the time. But I was proud of myself. Even then, I was looking at right. like, you know, OPS and, and weighted on base because it really gets to not how like, secret a stat is or how complicated a stat is like some stats are too complicated it's just like what what tells you the best story or you know what helps you get closer to the truth like i think we all know you can hit 220 and still be a good hitter if you get on base and you you know crush homers like batting average doesn't tell you the the meaningful story but when you can get into some of the deeper stats and yeah at first it was fan graphs for me and baseball reference and prospectus and obviously that's grown into Statcast and savant and um now there's like a whole other community of people who are taking things uh and building off that you know like i like i'm not gonna say his name right probably but connor curson uh is is coming up with some cool stuff and oh, yeah. you know you guys have you guys at picture list and like it's cool that there's like this almost next generation of people who are taking this raw data and coming up with interesting and cool stuff. Um, I think a lot of it depends on like what kind of audience you're shooting for. Like, I think a lot of people are just like that 1% edge to help me in my fantasy league is what I want. Even if it's like 70 times more complicated to get to there. And like for that usage, that's cool. Um, when I'm trying to do like an ESPN show, I'm interested in telling the right story, but also with like something I can explain in the next five seconds. <laughs> you know? right, so yeah. there's like a lot of different ways to go about it, depending on who you're trying to talk to. Yeah, I remember you actually mentioning just saying, hey, this guy is 10% better. Right. It's just right. a quick, easy way of saying like he is good. He's good by this amount more. And that's a quick digestible way of presenting that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, Jeremy, for you as well, I mean, when you started getting into this stuff and you're talking about the play index, do you find yourself gravitating to different things now than you used to in initially? Yeah, I'm definitely more interested in the advanced average followers which is kind of tough because i'll post something that i find really interesting like a very deep stat cast stat that i found on baseball savant and no one really cares about it like there might be like 20 people out there that care but like i care so like who really cares what everyone thinks but um, in terms of growing a twitter account you have to kind of post what your followers are interested in which is more of those random stats so i tend to try and make the majority of my posts during the baseball season about like just fun, like things that you'd find on an ESPN broadcast, like a fun fact. Like those are kind of like my brand at this point, I think. Um, I personally, I'm more interested in like advanced stats, like I mentioned. So like I'll, I'll have a lot of stuff that I don't even put out there that I'm just doing on my like on my laptop, like trying to look at like new metrics and stuff like that that I might not even post because no one would really find it interesting. But yeah, for me, it's really just 
a balancing game between what I think people would find interesting and what I find interesting, which I, I'm not saying I don't find the random sides interesting. It's just because those are like really easy to talk about with your friends. Like no one really cares. Sure. Like I was like, oh, like this guy has like a 135 WRC plus over the last two months. Like cool, but like not as many people are going to go Texas to their friends or to like their parents or whatever. Like, whereas if I say, oh, he's the first player to hit three home runs in a game since since this guy or whatever. So like, it's a lot, it's a, in terms of like what people will talk about versus what I guess what I find interesting. So I don't know so, if I really okay, answered so your what question. You're telling me, what you're telling me is you're going to change your Twitter handle from MLB random stats to MLB random stats that I think you might actually like. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's okay. It's really tough. Like there are a lot of people that really love the advanced stats that follow me, but it's definitely a smaller percentage of it. So like when I'm looking at like, oh, like what are my, which of my tweets are getting the most retweets? It's the ones that are very simple, like very easy to understand something that you'd find on the bottom line scroller of ESPN or something like that. Like be the first one to tweet like, oh, he's the first leadoff hitter with a three home run game for the Dodgers since blah, 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 or whatever. Those sure. ones go like, blow up really quick. Whereas like, I might post something about some guy X Wobble, which might be like the most insightful thing anyone's ever posted on Twitter in two months, in my opinion, but like no one even really cares about it. So, <laughs> well, it looks like the Marty McParty 611 says that he's going to care or she's going to care. So, uh, so definitely <laughs> that's keep my posting friend Josh. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, uh, but no, I mean, I, I kind of just want you to post like some random guy's batting average from 1978 just out of the that blue some days. Because technically you're that's right. What, that's what I want. That's the kind of content that, that I'm looking for. That I mean. very, like, very specifically sought out. To, um, like My criteria was very specific on the play index. Like I was looking for this exact thing. So technically it's the opposite of random. I should just right, post that like, like, I could post out like 412 home runs. Like just that, that's the whole yeah. thing. That would be fun. <laughs> You should do that. Okay, maybe like April Fool's Day or something like that. It yeah. is opening day, but still, you can do some fun things like that. I think I think that would yeah. be great. Um, all right, so I so some direct questions now. What would you say is your favorite weird stat? We'll start with you, Jeremy. Well, I think the one I have to pick is the one that kind of blew my Twitter account. Like it, it didn't really blow my Twitter account. I, I had a pretty big following when I posted it, but I probably gained fifteen thousand followers from it. And it was about Joey Votto and how he never pops out in the infield. I feel like most baseball fans know the stat. It might have been fun before I posted it. I don't know. But I don't know what the exact number is, but just the fact that, like, I think he was 20 times better at avoiding pop-outs than the average player is. It's just, like, a specific thing to, like, be good at. But, of course, Joey Votto is good at it. Like, leave it to Joey Votto to just be very good at this very specific thing that, like, no one would even look for except, like, you're just sorting by random things and see his IFFB percentage is really low or something like that. But it's really crazy to me that, his back control is just that good to like, like I, I play like a little league season of 18 games. I'll pop out once a game or something like that. And then he's doing it against major league pitchers popping out like once or twice in a full season. Like it's ridiculous. Oh, absolutely. I, I feel like Joey Votto is the closest thing we have to Adrian Beltre right now. You know, yeah, just like he's, he's always really good. And I just love his antics, like who he is on the field and how he talks about the game. And he has such a, like a, I don't know. He's clearly enjoying his time playing baseball. Uh, yeah, no doubt. It doesn't, doesn't pop out is always a great thing uh what would you say mike well it's a tremendous bummer because that is the only right answer like that is literally <laughs> the only answer one can get um but since i'm going to pivot to something else i remember like two years ago i can't remember if it was 2018 or 19 um but the uh the astros were going the entire season without giving an intentional walk all right like i thought that was my favorite thing and then uh the next year the a's made it through almost the entire season without putting down a sacrifice bunt or getting a bunt hit or whatever it was. And I remember I, like, I tweeted about it and I wrote about it. And then my wife and I went off like, you know, around Labor Day or something, just like on a brief, like two day vacation. And they did it, of course. <laughs> and I look at my, like, I'm trying not to look at Twitter and I turn on Twitter one morning and I just have like, you know, 50 tweets saying, they did it, they did it, you missed it, you missed it, they did it. <laughs> so like, even those things are not like, you know, advanced crazy metrics or anything, but it's sort of fun when you can say this is a thing that would have never, ever, ever happened for like 98% of baseball history. And baseball has changed so much that this is just like a thing you could conceive now. Like there were teams that probably couldn't go a week without a sack bun back in the 1940s. And here's a team that did like almost the whole season. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's the beauty of baseball, right? And like why, uh, yeah, why you guys talk about stats so much? Because we have so many just random you know, variables that you can throw together for something. Yeah. Another, like, another good one. 
another go jumping off that sorry to interrupt yeah. you there but it was it's about joey gallo who is just a terrific guy if you're looking for really fun stats i'm pretty sure i wasn't sure if, it, if he got to 100 or not but i think he had 100 home runs before his first sacrifice fly if not he had like 99 or 98 and he had a sacrifice fly right before he had 100 home run it was one or the other oh, either he and then hit a sacrifice fly like right away or it was the other way around but regardless it was like the longest most home runs a player hit without a sacrifice fly which of course joey gallo would do that because there's a runner on third he's not changing What's, he's not trying to to hit yeah. a, like a weak fly ball and drive this guy, and he's swinging for the fence no matter what. He just hit bombs. Like, he sure didn't do it on accident. Like that. Like you can't do that. I, like I, it's just weird. I don't know. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Chris Davis going 247 for four straight years. <laughs> I mean, what? Th that's just re regardless of the actual sport for s any sport to have some rate that's exactly the same for four straight years, let alone one that's a you know full season. And like every single day at the end of the year, it'd be 247 watch. Yeah. As we're hoping that he does whatever he needs to do and he would just get there. Yeah. Like, you're like rooting for like the, you're like rooting for the official score to like rule something a hit just so like right. it like pumps it up like half a percentage or something like that. I mean, wasn't he at like 244 the year before or the year after too? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, exactly 244 before the whole thing started. Uh, you know, but that that's like, to me, that just is a perfect example of why we love this stuff because it unifies all of us. Like all of us on Twitter are just like, that's all that matters today is that Chris exactly. Davis gets what he needs to get a 247 average. Uh, <laughs> it's that kind of stuff that's, that's just blows my mind. Um, what would you guys say? Cause you guys obviously deal with so many numbers and so many different things. Uh, what would you say is an underrated stat uh, that you think people should be using more often? Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Oh, you know, what's funny is like, I'm not sure I have one, I'll give you one, but I'm not sure one exists, at least within this community, because like if there's a stat that's cool, people are using it, right? Mm -hmm. And they're using it a lot. Um, the one I like, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think it's interesting is, is on Baseball Savant. Uh, this is for both pitter, pitchers and hitters. We got the pitch type values, and I know they've got that at Fancrafts too, but this one's a little different because this one is also about like the runners on base and every pitch and not just outcomes, right? Like it includes count and, and outs and inning and all this kind of stuff. And you'd expect some of the guys are at the top, like Freddie Freeman murders four seam fastballs, no shot. Devin Williams' change up is great, but it's, it's sort of fun if you want to drill down and you look like on a rate basis – who has the best fastball. And um, I was shocked to find that last year it was Brady Lell. And if you can guess what team Brady Lell is on, then you follow baseball even more closely than I do. I'm not saying it makes him a great pitcher. I'm not saying it's going to make him have a great fastball next year, but it's stuff like that where it's like, I don't think about Brady Lell at all. I should go look into him now. You know, that happens a lot. It's just like, here's a leaderboard, the top nine guys of 10, I would expect. And what the heck's that 10th guy? Why is Blake Taylor on this leaderboard? You know, <laughs> like, right. Yeah, I'm seeing uh, Asher Jatel say like former Yankee prospect Brady Lale in all caps here. Uh, he's he's a he's not a starter, so I have no idea who that is, of course. Uh, but I do actually remember Denilson Lomet, I believe, has a negative twenty run about, which is a, which is positive essentially in his favor. And I think the next highest pitch is a negative nine. Uh, something like that. A part of that is like usage because that's a counting stat. Well, sure, and he throws yeah, he throws it over fifty percent of the time. Right. Yeah. But like so, like Lael was on a on a rate basis. Again, if he threw it or if he pitched a lot, uh, mm. maybe it wouldn't be so well. He's on Seattle, by the way. Okay, noted. <laughs> Very much noted. Uh, that that's an awesome one, I think. And like, I do feel that when it comes to pitch metrics individually, we're just kind of scratching the surface with this stuff. There's a lot of different ways to use them and and moving forward. And yeah, the one on Fangraphs PVAL, I believe. That takes the uh, the run expectancy change and just assigns it to it, um, and just flat out does that, which to me always kind of bothered me because like you can throw the same exact pitch in two scenarios, but have a different outcome and it's just going to give a different value for it, even though the exact pitch and all the different variables assigned with it were exactly the same, right? Right, right. I mean, even this is without some context, right? Like it, you know, well, exactly, you don't get extra. Yeah. You don't get extra credit for setting up that change up with a fastball before, or whatever yep. the case may be. Right. Oh, That's... man. Sequencing. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll get, get there, there. eventually. <laughs> <laughs> one day. One day we're getting that with as much granular data that we have. Um, that's, a, that's a really good one. Jeremy, what would you say is an underrated stat? That's a really tough question to answer because I feel like if you ask two different communities, they'll give you like two oh, different yeah. answers. Like I feel like if you like put two, if you ask like, oh like what's an underrated stat for like people who like don't really like stats, I'm like, oh like OPS, sure. Yep. And like an underrated <laughs> stat for people who like really like love stats. 
batting average maybe because everyone's like, oh, it doesn't matter whatsoever. But like it matters a little bit. And if it's a little bit more important than nothing, then maybe it's underrated. But I think the I think one stat that is underrated amongst like both groups of people is WPA. I'm a big WPA guy. I think like for like MVP races, it's very important. It's it's win probability added if you're not familiar with it. I think it it's really good because it's an advanced stat, but like it's kind of like the like the RBI of advanced stats. Like it measures how much a player is affecting a team's win probability, but like it, it's it's like way better than RBIs is because it's it's way more like player centric. It doesn't really have as much to do with what their teammates are setting up for them. And I think it, it should be one of the the more looked at metrics when you're looking at an MVP race because that's exactly what MVP like most valuable players acting. If you're if you're increasing your team's win probability by seven wins over a season, that's exactly what less what war is trying to answer but war is way more context neutral which is good if you're looking at how good a player is but if you're looking at how valuable a player was for a specific season i think wpa does a really good job of answering that question and i don't think really many people take that into account at all like if you're looking to trade for a guy you're not looking at their wpa it doesn't really matter at all when evaluating a player but looking at what they added to their team which a lot of twitter conversations are about because people love to argue wpa is not a bad one to look at in my opinion Oh man, people love to argue. That's the understatement of this panel. <laughs> I, but uh, I mean, WPA I think is a really, really good choice there. Uh, so it just if I'm hearing it right, I, I like the Cy Young conversation that I hear every year. It's like, oh, this guy should get or that. I remember it was Verlander versus Cole. I was actually on the Verlander side. I think the entire pitcherless staff was on the Cole side, and they were yelling at me about this. And I, uh, and it, it's interesting because I. With all these advanced metrics that we have, ways to talk about pitching, which you know I, I love going into, at the end of the day, when you talk about these awards, like Cy Young and MVP, for me personally, it's about, I don't care what like the underlying performance is, I care about actually what, the, what they did, you know, what, the, right. what the numbers were. It doesn't matter if it came with a, you know, a, a point, you know, 100 Babbitt, I don't care. Like at the end of the day, that's what he got, you know? And I feel like WPA, what you're saying, Jeremy, is more of that. This is actually what happened as opposed to war, which is more of just like a general sense of how they performed. Is that right? Definitely. Yeah, I 100% agree. And like, obviously, WP is going to come with some caveats. Like if a pitcher does allow a 100 BABIP, it's probably because his defense helped him out a lot, which definitely sure. needs to be taken into account. So it's obviously not the MLB, which is why war could be important to see how much did this pitcher, like how much of these pitchers' numbers were because of the pitcher, which definitely WP is not the only thing to take into account. But I do think it's really good at looking at like, oh, like how did he specifically impact his team's chances of winning? And if he, if every game he went out there and his team had a 55% chance of winning before he batted and a 60% chance after on average, and he's adding 5% every time he comes to bat, he's a valuable player in my opinion. Doesn't matter if he's good or not. If he's look, if you're asking who's the most valuable, that's one of the things you should look at in my opinion. Definitely. Um, just to just to add some extra flair. Obviously, I'm going to talk about pitching stat because, duh, I don't care about your hitters. Like, we might yeah, have my more cutouts. I'll take it. Take it somewhere. Where is, where is hitter list? When do we get that? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but I. But yeah, there've been there've been two that I've been actually focusing on a little bit more this off season. Um, one is is very widely accessible, which is just hit per nine, and it's just an easy expression of saying like, hey, like how often are they able to give up hits? And it's kind of. You know, we often look at, say, like, walk rates, or we look at, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, like, bad baby, home run, fly ball rate, that kind of stuff. But just at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, how are they good? Are they just limiting, allowing hits? You know, not necessarily the harder weak contact, like what happened. And you'll see lots of, uh, you'll see constantly through season through season, like, some consistency there with guys that are constantly above a nine hit for nine, for example, as opposed to, say, like, a seven or a six that we see from elite pitchers. And it actually is a decent indication of that. The other one I've been throwing around in my head for ages, and I feel like it should be a thing, which is pitches per out. Essentially, how many pitches does it take for every pitcher to earn just one out? Um, and we don't really, I mean, like we talk about like efficiency of, uh, you know, for six innings, oh, they're a quality start guy, or they, you know, they'll go deep into games or something like that. But we haven't really showcased the effect of walking a lot of batters, for example, and how that translates to their innings. Or, you know, maybe Lance Lynn, yeah, he gets a lot of innings, but is he necessarily efficient? I don't know. He needs like 110 to get through six every time. You know, that doesn't right. necessarily mean that he's efficient. It's just that he just, well, they'll just let him go for ages. And we can actually point to him having stamina as opposed to someone else like Dallas Keuchel, who I think is able to generate quick outs because he throws lots of sinkers and those at-bats don't get deep often. Uh, so I, I keep thinking like pitches per out, like that's, 
that's something that we should care about. And I, I just haven't done that yet, but I feel like it's underrated. Yeah, uh, does that, does that? that exist? Have I don't think published so. That I'm sure you could do like, like, no, I haven't quick published quick. that. I'm like, I'm revealing it now. But okay. Like, I feel yeah. like that should be a thing. I'm I'm fascinated to see that because I think you made a good point for it. I'm, I'm a little out on hits per nine just because I don't really like anything per nine. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I get that. Yeah. percentages. Uh, but pitches per out, I think would be really fascinating. And I think it would be kind of cool to break it down further than just like overall, right? Like does it change in the first inning as compared to the eighth inning? You know, right. like, yeah. is it about... You know, you're facing the top of the lineup or the bottom of the lineup. Exactly. I don't know, I mean, cool. We've often we've often said like 90 pit or 15 pitches per inning is what you're going for for a pitcher, right? So then that's like five. If you get five pitches per out, then you can kind of like go through a start and say like, oh man, he's at you know 35 uh, pitches or whatever. Like, okay, hold on, he better be like in the third inning with one out or something yeah. like that, right? You know what else you could use that for is um some sort of entertainment value, right? Like I feel like I would rather watch Mark a pitcher Curley who gets. So good at that. Yeah, mm, well, it's yeah. like you know, like Blake Snell is a, a very talented pitcher. He's very, very good. He is not high on my list of like guys I love to watch because I feel like he's always battling and always going deep into counts. You know, yep. and I guess it's the raised way, but that's part of the reason I think he never goes that deep into games. Um, but I would be fascinated to sort of line that up with like you know my list of dudes I like to watch and their pitches <laughs> per hour. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even actually in Game Six of the World Series, right? He was at seventy three pitches. Well, he actually did the one thing that he's normally not doing, which is throwing uh, curveballs and sliders inside the zone. So that means right. he had fewer pitches <laughs> right. per out finally because he actually threw lots of strikes with them. And of course, that's when he gets pulled because, all right, we're not going to talk about that anymore. But anyway, that's something I'm, I'm curious about. Um, all right, let's move on to the, the next question is, so we, we've talked about a lot of different areas like your you know, WPA you're talking about. Um, and there are different ways for us to express baseball, right? That's kind of what we're all doing is we're trying to find different ways to give more information, to think about the game in a different way. Uh, what areas do you guys think we can continue evolving and, and be better at this? I, something that comes to mind really quickly, Mike, is the work you've done um, with defensive metrics. Um, and I kind of I'm curious, maybe it is defensive, defensive metrics, maybe it's something else. So where would you see the uh, the biggest growth uh, for uh, for statistics moving forward? There's probably like five different answers to that. I mean, I think the stock answer is is health, right? Preventing pitcher mm -hmm. injuries. But I'm not going to be the one who fixes that. I don't think anybody <laughs> has it. It might not even be possible, um, but I, I think what I'm really interested in, and I, I keep trying to get us to work on it, and it just never ends up being top of the list, is I want to come up with a real good positioning metric. You know, I want to know, I keep hearing over the last couple of years, like the Diamondbacks are really good at putting their guys in the right spot, you know, and the Dodgers and, and some other teams. I want to know if that's true, you know, and then it's, it's complicated because it's like, if you put the guy exactly where the ball was going to go, is that because you did a great job or because just sort of dumb luck that that happened to go there? You know, it's sort of this thing that opens up a bunch of rabbit holes. Um, but that's one thing I'm interested in. And another thing is, and I was, I reached out to like driveline and friends with teams last year. And I was shocked to find that nobody had ever really seriously studied this. What is the uh, effect in game of different looks, right? You guys all remember the cursed Tampa Bay alarm clock from hell yes. last year. Yeah, exactly. Like I kind of wrote about that at first and I think Oakland's doing it now, but I've never really seen anybody do a good study as to like, does that matter if you're coming from a high right-handed point or like, you know, a low lefty flamethrower point or whatever. I want, I want to see someone do that. And that's all public data. Like, I feel like anybody could jump on that one. Oh, that's a really, really good one. Yeah. Release points. It's always such a weird thing of, uh, you know, we talk about righty lefty splits, but it's really just about where the ball is starting and a righty can throw it from different angles and it's a completely different experience. You know, we also talk about some guys that are immune to splits and maybe has to do with the release point. Maybe that's actually what the, the ticket is there. That's a really, really good point. Uh, Jeremy, where, where's your mind at? Um, one thing I, one thing I think that, um, baseball sets could get more advanced and especially publicly, I'm sure there, there exists private, um, like metrics for each team that I'm sure they each have them, but there's no really good place where you can go and be like, Oh, like who's the best pinch hitter to bring in against this specific pitcher right now? Like you can eyeball, like look at splits, look at like the ballpark, look at the situation, whatever, but there's no like place where you can just plug in like, Oh, what's the situation? Who should, who should I bring in to hit right now? Or who should I bring in to face this batter right now? Like, yes, the splits exist. But there's no like actual like metric that we have that you can just go plug it in online. And be like, oh, the computer says put in this. Like there are Twitter accounts that be like, oh, here's should you go for it on fourth down or like they get their decisions that like the computer is deciding. Like, oh, 
this will help your ex win probability by this percentage if you go for it versus kick a field goal versus punt it. But there's really nothing like that for should I take this pitcher out right now or should I bring in this relief pitcher versus this relief pitcher? And yes, we can sort of answer those questions based on different like uh, lots of lots of evidence that we have with splits and, and all that kind of stuff, but we don't have like an actual like formula, which obviously I'm not smart enough to do or else you probably have it by now, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to answer. But there's, for all the criticism managers get for decisions that backfire in game, it's not like we have it that much better. Like we could say like, oh, you probably shouldn't put in this guy, but there's no like actual, like putting in this guy would have added 10% to your win probability. And I'm kind of surprised that that doesn't exist to be honest. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good point. Um, can you call it gut in some way, like G-U-T, like make that acronym <laughs> when you do come up, come up with it? Because like, I just want to trust the gut. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, that's, what, that's what that has to be. Um, I'll pivot. I'll, I'll say something about a hitter. I know it's blasphemy. Um, I think it would be really interesting to go more into bat path and bat travel and understand uh, how swings are done. Because, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Connor Kirkland, I think, uh, maybe I'm saying it wrong. I don't know. I'm terrible with names. <laughs> uh, Connor's work, no, really, and I think Alex Chamberlain worked on it too, was uh, was angles of pitches and how that affects, you know, uh, fly ball rates and ground balls and so on, like how the pitch is actually coming in. Uh, and if we can analyze, you know, bat travel, like how they're going through the zone. Yeah, you know, I remember seeing so many side angle shots of Manny Ramirez while I was playing, like Little League and everything. Because we're just talking about how long his bat is in the zone and how how wonderful his bat travel is, uh, and if we can do a better job of understanding that and seeing that, and having that data, then we can actually say, you know, trust your gut, you know, whatever you come up with there, Jeremy. You can actually say that's the better guy to do it because he actually has a better angle with his natural bat path for the pitches that this guy is gonna be throwing. Uh, I I like we have so much data about how the pitcher controls things. At this point, we're getting all these things about the the variable of a pitch, but we're not getting so much about like what the batter themselves are doing in reaction to it, right? Uh, we know like yeah. the result of it, but we don't know like them. Like, what are they doing? Like, I don't know. You generated that thing, but what are you doing? Like, I got nothing. Yeah, so I, I was. If we'll be I read. To do that. I read someone's post. I forgot who it was. I'm sorry if this was you, but um, it was about how there's actually like no random variance in baseball. It's just a bunch of things that we can't explain. And I feel like, especially with StatCast, yeah. that's kind of where we're at. It's just baseball is just one really like big physics problem. And we're just trying to figure out as many parts of that problem where we can say a lot about a player based on how much we know about what's going on. But it's really, yeah, baseball stats for the next, until baseball is not a sport anymore. It's just going to be about finding that next until. part of the problem that we can solve. It's really all it is. Until this is not an inevitability. <laughs> until until the end of time. Word. Until <laughs> the end of it, we figured out physics perfectly, and we can say, "No way, we'll change enough of the rules." We'll just, actually, yeah. that. It'll just, it'll just be on my spreadsheet. We'll figure we'll it out. Yeah, yeah. We'll just have OTP running all the time. That's, that's all it's going to be. Um, all right, um, I'm moving on here. So, uh, what would you guys say is one underrated player that sticks out to you because of some weird stats that they have? It's just like, oh, there's that one guy. That I think should be really good because the stats say he is, and it's just he's not getting enough appreciation for it. Mike, we'll start with you. Uh, I already feel like a cheese ball saying this because in this community, I don't think he's underrated, but in the greater baseball community, he's definitely like not thought of as much. And I'm only going to say because he just got traded, which is my boy Franchi Cordero. And mm. I I get it. There's like a 95% bust rate. Like there's an enormous chance that he never turns these tools into anything whatsoever. And, you know, you got to stay healthy and you got to make contact. And I'm not trying to overthink like his 9% strikeout rate in 42 plate appearances this year. But I think we all know about that. But I was thinking about this, like even last year, you look at his line and it just wasn't that good. And even in the few plate appearances he had, he crushed the ball. Like when he makes contact, he's basically Bryce Harper. And I get that the when he makes contact is doing a considerable amount of the work there. because like he strikes out a lot, but he is he is like a stat cast king. And that doesn't make you, mean he's a great baseball player. Um, I think part of it is I just didn't like Andrew Benatendi very much, and I didn't like the trade for the Royals very much. But when I saw the reaction from people, um, like quote-unquote traditional people, they were stunned. And I, I get it. If you're a Red Sox fan, Benatendi helped you win a World Series, and it's a, it's a bummer, and you don't really know who this other guy is or who the players to be named are. I get it. But I feel like everybody was thinking about this from like a 2018 point of view, Whereas Ben Attendi was like this hero and making great catches and having iconic photos taken of him. And I was thinking to myself, I, eh, Ben Attendi's okay, but I still want to see like that one year where Cordero gets 400 plate appearances and puts holes in the sicko side. 
maybe it'll never happen, but he's always going to be my guy. You know, that kind of reminds me of Franimal, right? Uh, Franimal Reyes. We were waiting for him to get like unleashed. And what do you do? He had like 36 home runs or whatever, or something ridiculous for uh, for Cleveland. Yeah, former teammates. Now, the difference is Cordero can at least run and play some outfield, uh, right whereas now. I don't think yeah. Franimal can ever do that. But <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly could not. Uh, but no, I think that's a great pick. Uh, what about you, Jeremy? Um, I'm going to pick a player that's a little better, but I still think he's underrated, especially amongst um, the people who don't use baseball stats as much. And that's my favorite player, Matt Chapman. I think he's like the perfect mm. um, the perfect mold for an underrated player. He plays in Oakland where I think every player is underrated there. No one really watches their games, unfortunately. And also he gets most he gets a lot of his value on defense. I think um, in terms of public perception, if you're 25 runs <laughs> on off, um, compared to 25 runs above average on defense, hope your guitars are okay. We're good. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. But I think um, a player that's a, will get 25 runs better than the average player on defense is a lot less, um, I guess, a lot more underrated than someone who does the same with his bat, just because it's a lot easier to quantify for people. Like, oh, like he hits home runs, he's a good hitter, but it's hard to quantify for people that don't use stats, uh, saving runs. And I think Matt Chapman, one of, if not the best defender in baseball, and also quite good with the bat, too. I think that's where he's underrated a lot in terms of the advanced stat community. His stat cast metrics are all really good. He hits the ball really hard. He always is near the top of the league in barrels when he's healthy. And so if he can get actually, he seems to underperform a lot every year in terms of his stat cast numbers versus what he's actually doing. And a lot of that's because he plays in Oakland, I think, which is a really tough ballpark to hit in. But if he can one year have a year where he overperforms his numbers and also his defense is 25 runs above average, he's an MVP candidate like he always is, but like he has a really good case because his batting numbers are there. Can, can I share this? This reminds me of like a really interesting thing I haven't written about or tweeted about. And I keep saying I'm going to, um, and it, it goes just to the impact that Chapman has on the A's, right? So the A's as a team, they don't shift very much, right? If you go back to 2019, they're like 17th most in infield shifts. And last year they're like 21st most, right? But Chapman got hurt. And I think he missed like the whole season after the end of August or, or something close to that. Right. So in July and August, they shifted 15% of the time and that was next to last. And in September without him, they shifted 49% of the time, which was third Crazy. most just for missing Matt Chapman wow. and having to play. I, I don't even remember Jake Lamb, maybe. Um, but it also sort of colors the way I think about Marcus Simeon as a shortstop, because it's like you are a lot freer when you've got Matt Chapman next to you uh, mm -hmm. than when you don't. Because like Jeremy said, the man is like I've taken heat before for saying I think he's as good a defender as Nolan Arenado. And I, I kind of think it's true. <laughs> yeah, he's a better yeah. hitter, too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we'll see this year. Maybe Nolan doesn't adapt necessarily to uh, St. Louis and outside of cores and also Matt Chapman gets his uh i don't know his praise that he deserves i love matt chapman i think that's and that's the whole cool. thing with chapman is that the one guy that everyone will compare him to is arenada because he's the only third baseman with a similar a similar skill set i'd probably say like you can say rendon is or bregman but they're not as good as defense as, as chapman and arenado it's they're the clear only two players that are above average on offense and are great with the glove like like the like gold glove great i hate using gold gloves but they're the only two guys that i would put in that tier and so naturally you compare them to each other and it's really tough to compare their bats because you have two two guys coming from extreme ballparks, one from Oakland, who it's really hard to hit there, and one coming from Colorado, where sure. we don't know the exact force effect, but it's much easier to hit there than it is to hit in any other ballpark. So you're comparing their offensive numbers, and you'll have Chapman with better park-adjusted numbers most years because even though his like Wobo will be much worse, the the ballpark metrics will bring him back into line. But I'm really interested to see what happens with, um, with Arenado in – in St. Louis now, like we saw it with LeMahieu, we don't know if it's a fluke or not that he actually got better with the bat once he went to New York. Is Arenado going to be the same way? I'm interested to see what happens there. Yeah, definitely, I'd probably throw Machado in there as well. Uh, I don't know how defensively yeah. he's he's in stage. He was since before. He definitely was there. Like young yeah. Machado would definitely be in that too. I'm not sure if he's there anymore, yeah. but definitely was. Yeah. Cabrian Hayes this year is the guy to watch. Oh, that'd be defense. cool. I would love yeah. to see that. Oh. Pittsburgh needs something right now uh, because actually I think the guy, I mean, I could list a lot of pitchers. I get a sense that are just underrated outside of the fantasy world, essentially. Um, but for me, it's like Joe Musgrove. Uh, I don't think people recognize enough how effective his breaking balls are. Uh, and when he's going, he's, his like curveball and slider are some of the best breaking balls in the majors. 
Um, we just haven't seen him go really a full season with an adjustment of throwing more breaking balls before. Uh, and so I remember like the, it was a big thing on Twitter, I think, when he was dealt to the Padres. But, uh, you know, everyone, yeah, for like a little bit, know, how to react, that. you know? And I was yeah. like, this is a huge thing. This is really, really, really cool. Uh, and it, it, I don't know. I mean, playing for Pittsburgh, not obviously a big spotlight there. I uh, but when I when I just look at Musgrove and just go, man, like your stuff is so good. This should work kind of like in some ways, uh, I mean, not on the same level, but Garrett Cole moved from Pittsburgh to to Houston. A lot of people expected to be better. And obviously he was uh, when he arrived, not in that way, but still it does get a sense of it getting out of Pittsburgh somewhere new. Hopefully his stuff gets a, a bigger spotlight. Yeah, there's, there's a small part of me that hopes he doesn't break out. Not because I don't like him. He seems like a good dude and he's an interesting pitcher, but like you said, I don't think Pirates fans can handle another guy <laughs> leaving and blowing oh. up. Like, well, Tyon's <laughs> going to be even better, so don't right, worry. Right, right, exactly. Oh, he doesn't get enough praise, but I've said that way too many times. Uh, I just have a couple more questions, guys. I... Uh, so one thing I think that's really, really hard, the biggest thing um, in your position is we have these amazing ways of presenting information, all the stats, but I mean, it has, it has gotten easier, but still not the easiest to just, you know, have stat vomit, right? And just like say all of them. And a lot of people are still like, dude, I don't know the analytics. I don't know saber metrics, all that kind of stuff. I just know baseball. And it's really hard to get over that, that, that wall what would you say is the most difficult information for you to convey uh to the average listener mike we'll start with you well i just wrote a whole thing trying to introduce uh you know spin direction and seam shifted wake which i only barely understand myself at this point <laughs> so like that's the kind of thing i think about this in the sense of like my dad and my uncle are both big mets fans and they're both smart guys you know um can i could i explain any of this to them in like 15 seconds, you know? So as you kind of referenced before, a lot of times I just don't, I'll just say like, Hey, this guy's 20% better than average. And I'll know that means he's got a 120 weighted runs created plus. I just don't want to say that. And it's right. fine. Cause if anybody looks it up, you know, they'll know I'm not just making up this number, but it really has to be, it has to be context is number one. Like that's the most important thing. Like I would never say he's got a 370 weighted on base because what does that mean? Is that good? Is that bad? Who who knows, right? So you, you got to try to put it in some sort of context, uh, and it's got to be worth the effort too. Like I don't want to, I don't want to use a stat that's like OPS is a great example, right? We all know the math, and that is kind of crappy. You can't really smash on base and slugging together because it doesn't really work that way. And yet, when you look at like the top thirty OPS plus leaders and the top thirty DRC plus leaders and the top thirty WRC plus leaders you probably have like a 95% overlap, <laughs> you know, like right, right. It, it works well enough. Now, if you're doing like a real research study, like something you're going to submit to like Sloan or something, then yeah, you know, use like the really good thing. Um, but if you're doing a radio hit or if you are on TV and it gets the story across correctly and it's based in some kind of math, like that's fine. I think it's like the right tool for the right job uh, based on the audience you have, because that's like the biggest part of it. Sure. Uh, that's a great answer. Jeremy, how about you? Yeah, I definitely agree with Mike. The, obviously, the, the more metrics that come out, the more abbreviations, people just don't really want to learn them, which I totally understand. But I think the best way to, to overcome that kind of thing, at least my favorite way, is like through data, data visualizations. I think if you can um, show like a, a scatter plot where uh, there's a corner where there's a bunch of good baseball players and everyone recognizes those names, and there's one name that's really surprising, like that gets the point across, even if you don't know what the axes are actually measuring. Like, if you like, oh, there's a corner with like Mike Trout, Mookie Betts, Cody Bellinger, and then like, oh, this random guy there, like, oh, that random guy's probably doing something really well. And you can kind of explain like the 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 bareness as like the bare minimum of like what you need to explain about each metric. But just the fact that like upright is good, down left is bad, that's usually good enough for a lot of people that don't really care to learn that kind of thing. Absolutely. A huge shout out to the graphics team, Nick Kahlo, for doing all of our charts to convey all that information, all our things. No, but definitely charts are a huge, huge thing with that. Um, and I kind of sticking with the same topic, what would you guys say is the most uh, misconstrued metric? One that's maybe used a little too frequently and not really getting the right point across. Uh, Mike, I see you nodding your head. What are you thinking? I, I have a good answer here. And we, I say like we, me and my teammates are probably a little at fault for this. Uh, just raw spin rate. Right. Mm -hmm. Like people have finally figured out spin rates, a cool thing to talk about, but I think too many people go into, well, it's high, so it's good. 
And it's like, well, no, it's it's potential, right? Like if you if you know how to use it, it can be good, but not everybody has to have a high spin rate. It's not just like a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and also the number doesn't mean anything. Like it, it does, but if I were to tell you, oh, his RPM is 1850, it's just a big, ugly number. No one, no one cares about that. You know, you need to know it's like 95th percentile curveball spin. Okay, that's cool. You can at least say his curveball spins more than almost anyone, um, but is he using it to get movement? So it's that and um, probably just average exit velocity. I hate average anything, really, but average exit velocity gets, yeah. I think, overused a lot as well. Oh, yeah, average exit velocity. No, do not do that. You can now, I think uh, I think Tom Tango actually put out a huge thing recently about looking at the more extreme ones, and that actually is the important one. Uh, the average, not so much. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike. Uh, when calculating average exit velocity in Savant, does that include foul balls or does it not? It does not because okay. uh, all, all foul balls aren't tracked, really, because the cameras and, and radar or whatever are all pointed at the field of play, so it just doesn't oh, get everything beautiful. anyway. Okay. Yeah. Great to hear that. I was, I was always confused with like the game feed or whatever. If I saw like a average exit velocity, I was like, is that including foul balls or not? Okay. No. Good. Very, very <laughs> glad to clear that up. Uh, Jeremy, uh, what would you say? I thought Mike was going to steal my answer when he started going, when he started going where he was going, but I was actually going to say um, average launch angle. I'm, I'm more of an anti-average launch angle person than exit velocity. Um, I've been probably in Tango's mentions for the last three years complaining about why we don't use like median and standard deviation instead of average because like average doesn't really tell you like maybe over a full season it might tell you a little bit but like mathematically like it's kind of dumb like if a guy has an average launch angle of 20 degrees that could either mean he had two home runs at 20 degrees or he had a pop-up at 60 degrees and a ground out at negative 20 degrees or something like that and those are two very different things that the, the metric will will say is the exact same thing so I think it's more important with launch angle for people to when you're when you're evaluating a player to look at their spread like their sweet spot percentage i know that's on on savant now but it's more of like where their their typical ball is rather than where their like their mean is i know it's like a very small difference to a lot of people but i think for a lot of players it could be a very big deal if you have if you have a guy like vado who doesn't pop out a lot like his launch angle is going to be lower but that's not necessarily a bad thing it's, it's better that he doesn't pop out a lot but his launch angle which a lot of people We'll just look at oh it's it's lower than it should be like you can't just look at it like that because he has a very low extreme value for things that are actually bad but it makes him look worse because of it. Oh, I I think that's a really good answer. Uh, I I'll, I'll go in the direction that um I I think people don't really think I would. I'm just gonna say BABIP. I don't know. It gets thrown around a lot as if like it's supposed to normalize at a certain rate and it's just completely luck based, and it's not. Uh, you know, especially, I mean, you're even talking about launch angle. Like if they hit more ground balls, again, no, that's fewer pop-ups, fewer can of corn. And generally grounders are going to do better for hits than, than fly balls are. So there are a lot of ways that influence BABIP uh, that you can't just say, oh, he had like a low or a high one. And we just know that's going to be better or not. I mean, Aaron Judge crushes the ball every single time. Like he is going to have an above average BABIP than the average other guy too. And and we like it's hard for us to just say it unless it's like you know if he has a 410 like Kesten Hura did in 2019 I'm like all right okay buddy not gonna happen same with like Yoran Mankata doing that on the other side if it's like 200 or like 150 fine but in the middle there it gets just thrown around and it's just that's not it doesn't tell us really much of anything and it's really all these other things that that tell a much different story I uh, but I wanted, I wanted, first of all, guys, listening to this in the chat, please leave any questions you have for, for Jeremy and Mike here. We got a couple more minutes. Um, I wanted to ask one specifically to you, Mike, when it comes to really with baseball savant and, uh, and kind of what's going forward. You don't have to say anything. I'm just kind of curious. Do you, do you know where you guys want to focus and expand when it comes to providing public data, maybe with Hawkeye opening us up to us at all or anything along those lines? Well, in terms of like what kinds of data we're allowed to put out there, that decision is made like nine levels above me. You know what I mean? So it's, it is, I think people actually have this idea sometimes that it's like tango in a dark room saying like, yes, I will put this out there, but Why no, I'm, I'm hiding that. It's Why isn't not. it though? Why can't we just let that happen? Please just give it to tango. It's, it's not. I mean, listen, <laughs> at, at a high, at a high level, you know, all 30 teams own the data and there's some things that they're happy to have out there to generate interest and, 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 you know, generate new employees. Like people have gotten hired by doing cool stuff. And for whatever reason, they want to keep some of it close to the vest. Um, I have my opinions on that, but I, I can confirm it's not me. It's not Darren. It's not Tango or Jason Bernard or any of us making those decisions. Like we, we have what we can put out and we make the best of that. 
Uh, I can tell you soonish, Darren's going to like completely revamp the uh, the game feed. So that's like the live thing. Like I've already seen it. It's cool. I think he's tweeted some of it. Um, like the new win probability charts are pretty, and you can look at all the games at once. That's super cool. Yeah. Tom is working on the next iteration of outs above average because like what you see is still really version one and obviously the new hardware system last year uh, had better tracking so that kind of allowed us to do some more things and just some code stuff so that'll be out soon and yeah we only really had two months of hawkeye right so that kind of yeah. taught us what worked and what didn't and full speed ahead from there yeah, really excited about that. I mean, we, we've talked about it uh, like over the years. It's gone from TrackMan. There was a pitch FX system. And it's I've even seen, I think, some seasons where like a stadium's uh, TrackMan was off and it got changed and like velocity readings were different and stuff like that. And to get settled in into one of those uh, and like, cool, we got kind of like the, the beta run. I don't know what else to call it from like last year out of the way. Now we've got like good, amazing Hawkeye data coming. Uh, and I can't be more excited about that. I know, like, super nerd over here, but oh, I can't wait for that. No, I, w without giving too much away, I can tell you that on July 22nd or whatever, the day before opening day ended up being last year, mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, I'm going to take tomorrow off. I'm going to check <laughs> back well, next week. Cause like, and it worked and it was great. Like, super credit to all the people on that team. It, it actually worked like shockingly well. And I was like, oh, this yeah. is great. <laughs> no, that, that was, you guys did an amazing job with that. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. And it, stuff to the game feed, that sounds great. Cannot be more excited about that. Um, but uh, but yeah, guys, leave a, Alex Fast says, uh, put me in coach uh, to you, Mike, uh, just, just so you know. Um, okay, Alex, that is not what that song is called. We'll have to talk about that. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, for you, I mean, when it comes to yeah, all the, all the data that you have, you're talking about the play index and everything, but what kind of stuff would you want to see uh, moving forward? Like, like what specifically do you mean? Like, like uh, okay, so you hear, you hear like Mike talking about, you know, all these different additions that they're doing. What would you want? Uh, to get more access to and to, and to yeah, get more information on? Well, ideally, I know Mike can't do anything about it and nothing is going <laughs> to really change. But the defensive metric specifically, it's just like, there's just not that much out there. And it's tough because the only people that can do stuff about it are the people that aren't really going to give it up, which is not like a slight on, on MLB. Like, I understand why there, it's a lot of data. Like, you can't just give up player tracking data for an entire season that it's like, terabytes upon terabytes of data and i understand why they can't give it up but i am also sure that there are a lot of people out there that with that data could do a very good job analyzing it that won't be in that position unless they actually work for mlb so that stuff that like will never that's like a, like a pipe dream like will never really change but would be really cool if they did or like if they were like they, they had like mock data where like they could just give like a couple games of data to kind of put in um like a, a system of what you would do over a full season but just kind of put it in for a couple to try and develop that kind of thing but not necessarily be able to go through an entire like season's worth of games and add up that metric for the entire season or something like that if it makes sense yeah well, i can yeah, say yeah. again not my decision i would be super down for saying like okay here's the month of august in 2016 you know like, here's all yeah go nuts because exactly. like it's not going to affect what teams do so, um i can't personally do that because even if i oh yeah was allowed to, i don't know how i don't know how to do that mike <laughs> yeah what do we and need I don't to know do what do we need like, to do? Whose doors do we need to bang on? Was that? Well, doors do we need to bang on? What do we need to do as a community to give us all of this data? Ah, uh, you can yell at everybody who <laughs> everyone on subscribe from LV TV until they release the data. <laughs> Here, here's what I can say about that. So, like, what Jeremy is saying, I, I totally get it. It makes sense, but it, it's funny to me because I'll see people kind of having uh, that same feedback, but then I'll also see people from other sports who are like. Wow, I can't believe baseball puts this much stuff out yeah, there. You know, because it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the we stuff, stuff, the hockey though. stuff. Like, yeah. yeah, but we have so much more. It's like every single game has more data than the entire football season. You know, it's like we have all this stuff. It's we are the example for statistics classes. It's it's just so we got to take advantage of it. And I will say, the last five years, especially with baseball savant and everything, it's gotten a lot more accessible. Uh, absurdly oh yeah, don't get so. me wrong. Don't get me wrong. What they have is what they have is definitely way better than if I was a basketball fan complaining about data. Like I'd be like, oh, like can you please release like this thing that like baseball has released five years ago? Like, don't get me wrong. It's way better than any of the other sports. Yeah. No. No. No offense taken whatsoever. Like obviously we want to put out as much as we possibly can without you know getting fired. So yeah. yeah no, I, <laughs> just, I just, we want all of it though, Mike. Give us. <laughs> Give us all the data. All right, all right. <laughs> anyway, put everything on like one Google Drive folder and just drop the link. There I won't it is. Tell anyone. Just just shadow <laughs> drop it one day. No, um, 
<laughs> We've run out of time. Uh, Jeremy Frank, Mike Petriello, thank you so much for being part of PitchCon. This was a joy. I selfishly made me uh, the host of this panel because I just want to talk to both of you. Uh, Mike, at some point, I hope you do play that guitar because it is glorious. And oh my God, I am incredibly jealous. Uh, oh, we're really just out of time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But really, thank you guys so much. Uh, this was fantastic. And yeah, thanks again for being a part of PitchCon. Yeah, Nick, by the way, what you and Alex and everybody are doing, is it, it's cool. And I know you're giving some of this to, to charity. And it's just it's cool to get the baseball community all together and to kick off the season. So great great job putting it together. Hey, it's because we have people like you being a part of it. So thank you. Uh, all right. Take care, guys. Thanks for having me on.